I always ask myself, what am I doing here for? What is the purpose of life? Does anyone even know that I existed? Does anyone even care? As a child, I used to live in fear. I'm always afraid that people will abandon me, people will reject me, and I'm always afraid that people do not love me. And I grew up believing that I am useless, I'm good for nothing, I am fat, I am ugly, I am a burden to be with, because that was what I was told. And if any of you watching this video right now, and you could echo with what I have went through, then I have a message for you. This is my story that I want to share with you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I am 46 years old this year and I live in Malaysia in a beautiful island named Penang. In my career as an image consultant, I have had many people came up to me and they told me they admire my boldness, my strength, uh, my persona and you know what? They have no idea what I have went through in order to be who I am today. And this is my story that I want to share with you. It's my testimony of breakthrough, a testimony of uh, victories from being a victim in the past to become a victor for God. For many years, even as an adult, I struggle with my self-image. I always think that I am not good enough. I always think that I am not pretty enough. Oh, basically, I'm just not enough. Yeah. And uh, it took me many, many years to uh, finally understand and see the person that God sees me. Yeah. And that changed everything. You see, on the day that I was born, I was actually left in a hospital. My biological parents uh, decided not to uh, bring me home, so they left after I was delivered. And I was left in the hospital for many days, and the nurses in the hospital finally realized that no one is going to come and, and claim this baby. And... Uh, they they asked around you know in the year 1970s uh, it, it's not so strict so um, people can actually adopt kids from the hospital or from from other families without really going through a legal process so there I was you know in a hospital and a family came and took me home for the first 12 years of my life I was living with my adopted mom and dad um, Things were alright, things were, were well for me at that time until when I was 12 years old, my adopted father died of a heart attack. After dad passed on, mom uh, couldn't really take care of me, yeah, and then that was when um, my adopted sister uh, decided to take me home, yeah, and that was when everything began. From age of 13 to 19, I was staying with my adopted sister and that was when I experienced um, uh, abuse after abuse for seven years. As a child, I never understand why um, I'm so much hated yeah I, I always ask myself why um, no one liked me no one loved me and um, I was constantly reminded that even my own parents uh, uh, gave me up and left me at the hospital so for that seven years it was um, painful to hear all these comments and um, being reminded again and again that I am really a burden to to be with I am not someone people would want to love I'm not someone I'm not the kind of child that um, you know their parents would really love them and call them 
precious and I can never understand. So every day I, I literally live in fear because um, I always get beaten. I always get beaten by my adopted sister um, for no reason at all. So I grew up knowing that if I don't please people and if I don't make people happy, regardless of whatever method, I will be beaten, I will be um, rejected. Um, yeah, so I actually grew into an adulthood having this attitude that I need to please people uh, no matter what is the way, no matter what is the, the method. And um, yeah, and that destroyed me. Uh, yeah, for that seven years living with my adopted sister, um, it destroyed me as a person. It destroyed me because um, as a child, I lost trust. I I have no reference point to my identity. I have no um, yeah. I have no one to turn to. So at the age of 19, I, I couldn't take it anymore, yeah, um, and um, at that time, I decided perhaps this is not a place for me, perhaps it's time to leave, yeah. So um, what pushes me to actually um, took the courage to pack my bags and leave uh, Kuala Lumpur at that time was um, this particular incident that yeah that just pushed me over. Yeah. So it was one evening. Um, I was in my room, and um, as usual, I heard a uh, very loud noise. Uh, my uh, adopted sister and her husband was fighting downstairs, and it it grew. Uh, it, it it the the fight got worse, and I I knew it deep in my heart. I knew it that. Um, uh, I will be the the one uh, to to be the receiving end, so to say. Yeah. So uh, true enough, I heard footsteps coming up uh, up to my room, and the door flung open. The door flung open, and uh, my adopted uh, sister was standing at the door, screaming my name. So uh, she came in, and then she yeah she beat me, and she pulled my hair. She pulled my hair and she dragged me down from the second floor to to the living room, and I and in the process I I can't really remember what happened, but uh, I think I lost consciousness. I, I I just I just can't remember. You know, uh, halfway through, and um, the next thing I remember was um, I woke up with severe pain on my head and and my body. And I was lying on the uh, live, uh, in the living room, yeah. And it was almost 11 p.m. So I woke up in pain and I cried. I saw, uh, and no one was around. So that night I challenged myself. I I gave myself two options: um, be afraid of uncertainty of the future, and continue to stay in this house, or give yourself a chance and see what is out there for you yeah so um, I actually took the challenge <laughs> I um, pack up everything that I have and I only have 280 in my pocket at that time uh, yeah um, I can relieve that night over and over and over again because that was uh, the day that changed my life so I um, I left yeah, with very little belonging, uh, and I left. So where did I go? <laughs> um, I I actually, uh, when I left that house, I took a minibus to uh, Puduraya at that time, and it's already almost midnight. Um, all the counter were were closed. All the counters were closed, and uh, not many people around. But um, I took the opportunity to walk around. 
from counter to counter and look at the names of destination of perhaps where should I go? Yeah. So, uh, and um, I came to Penang. <laughs> I came to Penang because uh, it was funny. Um, all the names stick on the counter is uh, very scary, like Kuala Trunganu, Kuala Kangsa, you know, that kind of thing. And I thought, uh, is there a more Englishy name uh, destination that I can go? And then I saw. Uh, uh, Penang, Penang Island, yeah, and I say, yeah, this is the place that I want to go, yeah. So I bought a ticket uh, at 7 a.m. the next morning, and I came to Penang. So when I arrived to Penang, I was very confident that I can get a job, that I can actually start my life anew uh, and leave everything behind, uh, because you know what? If you're, you know, I I, I was brought up to uh, believe that if your academic result were good and um, you are fluent in English and Bahasa, you should have no problem getting a job. But I was so wrong because when I came to Penang, I, I looked for a job. I was, you know, uh, very determined to get a job. I went to uh, companies to companies asking for clerical job and, and none of them replied. None of them accepted me. And then I was actually desperate and I went to uh, the one and only uh, department store in Penang at that time, in the 1993, yeah, it's Yao Han. And uh, I was looking for a promoter perhaps, or sales, you know, or office, anything, anything. But even so, I was turned down. And I become uh, desperate, you know, more and more desperate. So I jato my standard, you know, in English means I, I, I lower my standard. And I even went to, uh, you know, the the coffee uh, coffee you know, the coffee shop, to ask for a waitering jobs, serve, you know, serve coffee and tea or wash uh, dishes, you know. And I still couldn't get a job. And you know what was the reason? <laughs> So it was very funny because the only reason was that I don't speak Hokkien. And I didn't know, I didn't know that, you know, I'm born and bred in KL, I'm really fluent in Cantonese, and that uh, other states actually don't speak Cantonese. And uh, yeah, that was, that was my predicament at that time. I couldn't get a job because I can't speak Hokkien. Many weeks pass, uh, of course, uh, at that time, you know, uh, my... Uh, resources also running low, you know, uh, started off with 280 in my pocket and then um, it, it got so low that I actually checked out from uh, the hostel that I was staying at that time and uh, there were nights I sleep uh, in the park, there were nights I um, went to hospital lobby and I sleep, uh, bus terminal at Comta and there were some nights I even, um, you know, went to the um, police station and I asked, you know, can I just uh, wait here, you know, till morning and that was uh, how I, what I went through, yeah, for almost, you know, a week when my money was running low and it came this one Saturday, uh, I will, was left with only 20 ringgit in my pocket. Yeah. And I told myself, you know what, I, I tried, at least I tried. And uh, it's time to go back to where I came from, the very place that I want to run away from. And um, so I told myself, yeah, let's have uh, your last breakfast here in Penang. And then after breakfast, I'll go and get a ticket. And that was the time. God sent his angel. So I was I was eating my uh, uh, noodle and there, there was this uh, middle-aged lady uh, came to my table. She ordered her food and she came to my table and she asked uh, if she can share the table with me. And it was weird because I, I, I remember I look around, um, there were a lot of empty tables and uh, but she chose to sit with me so but my heart was filled with sorrow and heaviness I, it, that was not the time to argue why don't you sit elsewhere and I just motioned her yeah please feel free and sit and then I continue uh, eating my bowl of noodle and then suddenly um, maybe after three minutes or so and she said are you okay young lady because you look very sad and that was the time I looked up I look up, I look into her eyes, 
and I saw, I saw because here was a lady, a stranger, practically, um, took the courage to care, took the courage to feel, and took the courage to see that there's actually something wrong in someone else. So, yeah, and, and I cried. And I remember I cried so bad that she pulled her, her chair near me and then she just uh, placed her hands on my shoulder and she said, it's okay, it's okay, tell me. So I, I told her why what, what I was going through in KL, that I was uh, constantly uh, abused physically, uh, emotionally and mentally and how I ran away maybe three weeks ago and came to Penang and how I tried to get a job but I couldn't and then now uh, I have to get my ticket back to that house yeah so and I remember suddenly I begged her I actually begged her please please get me a job do you know anyone who is hiring it doesn't matter what job I just need a job I am back her and you know what? She she smiled and she didn't answer me. She she didn't say anything, but she took a pen from her handbag and she scribbled. She scribbled and she told me, "Come to this place on Monday at 9 a.m. I will meet you here." And Monday came. I went. It was a private hospital. And in my heart, I thought while waiting for her, I thought, "Oh, she, she's getting me a job here, so it doesn't matter what I do. I just need to get a job. I just need to get a place to stay, and um, I'll, I'll be fine." But she came, and then she actually brought me to the College of Nursing at the back of the hospital, and that was how my career started. I studied uh, nursing for three years, and I became a registered nurse. Uh, and I served in the operating theatre for five years in that hospital. So now, looking back, it's amazing how God has His hands in my life all the way. You know, the story of Abraham um, bringing Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice, and at, at, at that very last moment before he he you know, complete the act of sacrifice, God said, stop, for I have prepared you the sacrifice. And that, that really spoke a lot to me because at that very moment when I thought after that breakfast, I have to go and get a ticket and go back, and that was the very moment God said, stop, you are not meant to go back. I have greater plans for you here. And that was when he sent this lady and said, stop, bring her to where I have prepared for her. And it's my heart is just filled with gratefulness and thankfulness of how God really took care of me every step of the way. And if you're watching, um, you may be experiencing, I, I don't know what you're going through right now, you may be experiencing time when you have no idea what's happening to you. You seems like it's an, a dead end. It's, you know, you have nowhere to turn. That is where, that is where God will come and say, I have prepared something else for you. So I really encourage you, don't, don't, lose hope, don't give up your faith, don't quit because at that very last moment it is when the Lord appears and says I have greater plans for you yeah so that that was how you know I started my career as a nurse and I was very happy for for that five years working in the hospital um, my life was comfortable I got a place to stay and then you know I realized the surgeons that I work with, without fail, you know, every morning when I call in to work, they will ask me, Liz, you know what, get out of this place because you're not meant to be here. You're not meant to be in this operating theater. Go out and see, you know, uh, what else is there you can do. You, you can do better outside. You know, at that time, I don't understand because perhaps they see something that I don't see and... 
at this very moment, I'm really again filled with thanksgiving for that encouragement, all these uh, doctors' friends that I have that you know kind of like pushes me out of my comfort zone to seek for something more in my life. Yeah, and I took the challenge actually. I I hand in my resignation letter, and I left the hospital uh, that I work with. Yeah, for five years. So yeah, so uh, you know, um, and I pursue sales and marketing, and uh, for many years I was in the yeah in the sales and marketing job. And in year two thousand one four, I founded my own company. Yeah, I founded my own company, Elizabeth Image Branding, um, with the mission and vision to reach out to men and women. That have experienced what I've experienced, that struggle with self-image, that you know, um, being spiraled down in this bondage of lies, that they can't see how precious their life is. They they can't see how, you know, um, that God actually said that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. So that that was my mission. That I want to help. People to get out of that and see, you know, the amazing things that we can do. The moment we recognize who the person God has created us to be. So of course, you know, during that that moment uh, in my adulthood, I I struggle a lot. You know, uh, it's a process of growth. Yeah, I can say that. Uh, there there were a lot of times in in the beginning stage, I still struggle with uh, self image, with a lot of. Uh, uh, Lies that that I I you know reinforces in my life. Yeah, you know, in the morning I woke up, I I actually stared in the reflection of myself, and I told myself, you know, you are good for nothing. You you can you can't achieve anything great. You are a burden to be with. You are not pretty. You are fat. You are just not enough. You are just not not meant for greatness and that was what I told myself even though you know I left that home that always reinforces this that told me that I'm not good enough and even when I left that home I am doing that to myself and I didn't realize that until God opened my eyes to see you know there was one night actually God just just it, it was as if a will been taken off my eyes and said Liz, you know what you're doing to my creation, the person that I've created, the person that I have breath, you know, breathe my breath onto her and said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You know what you're doing to this person? You're constantly saying that my creation is not good enough. And I trembled at that thought of what I have done. Yeah. You know, we are all God's creation meant for greatness. We have been given His breath, His image in us. And really it was a revelation to me how dare we belittle this creation of God. Yeah. So that, that, that changed my whole perspective, you know. Like, no. Um, I have to do something. I have to honor the person that God created me to be. Yeah, I have to honor. I have to respect. I have to uh, treasure this creation of God. Yeah, and that that changed my life. And uh, in my course, uh, in my career as an image consultant, that is what um, I have set myself to do: to help men and women to really see who God has created them to be. Not someone that they can ridicule, not someone that they can trash, like you know, something that worth nothing. No, we are accountable for the creation that God has made us to be. Yeah. So, um, in year two one four, uh, with my company, I started all on my own, and right now I have a team of four stylists and uh, a very able and helpful. Uh, to uh, admin staff uh, and business uh, business development staff to to help me in my business to reach out more and uh, we are a team of uh, Christian uh, that has the same direction that has the same vision to reach out to people yeah 
Yeah. So uh, this is my uh, testimony to you. This is my sharing of my life uh, that, you know, how God turned someone that is basically, you know, um, doomed. Yeah, and without God, I wouldn't be who I am today. Really, yeah. Someone that is just to who I am today. Yeah. Um, someone authentic, bold, courageous, and with such power that has given to me. And I, I will continue my life to make his business my business every day. So I hope my sharing encourages you in one way or another. Stay blessed.